Hello everyone and welcome to episode 26 of the History Hotline. Today's episode is going to be about women resisting. And you might be thinking, okay, that's quite strange. Yes, it's still March and yes, it is still Women's History Month. And I wanted to continue exploring women's history, especially black women's history this month. Now, I'm recording this episode on the 14th of March and we are speaking within the context of, you know, it being Mother's Day number one. You know, it being the vigil of um, Sarah Everard's death and a remembrance vigil took place last night. Um, Today, we're faced with the aftermath of that um, because, true to form, the London Metropolitan Police absolutely bulldozed the peaceful vigil and set upon protesters, antagonised the crowds and it led to many arrests, it led to, to violence and it led to injuries on women and I'm sure men as well that were were simply there to pay their respects to a woman that was killed at the hands of the police. Now, going into all of that and even thinking about this podcast episode this week was quite heavy. It wasn't something I wanted to talk about. Um, It was something I wanted to ignore because dredging up all the memories of you know, all the walks home you do as a girl or a young woman or an older woman even, I don't really think it changes. Um, that fear you have of something potentially happening, that worry that, you know, texting the person who ha- whose house you're going to or your family to say, oh, I should be home at this time, I should be with you then. So if you're not, you know, something can be done. Sharing your live location, you know, sending your, your Uber details to make sure that if the the driver takes a different route or does something suspicious, someone will spot it before it's too late. All these things that we have to do, getting getting a taxi instead of getting public transport or walking, um, the cost of all these things that, that add up over time, if you can afford to even do that. Yeah, it's a lot. And there's been a lot of tone-deaf conversations on social media. There have been some productive ones. There have been some traumatic ones, some emotional ones. And whilst I don't want to spend this whole podcast talking about all of those conversations and reacting to them, because I don't think that's productive um, for this podcast, for our own mental well-being, um, I think it's maybe more productive if we think about a future where we don't have to do all these things, where we can feel safe. um, And whatever that future might look like for you as as a white woman, as a black woman, as an Asian woman, as a queer woman, as a trans woman, you know, it will be a different reality maybe for all of us, but I think moving on from where we are right now, hope is needed. Um, And so I kind of wanted to do something joyful for this episode, and I don't know if I've succeeded. I have been Googling, like, black joy women's joy for like the last like 24 48 hours just trying to find a happier topic because I think black history especially when we look at black women in history there is always trauma there is always suffering there is always a pushback to some kind of violence whether that's because of gender or race or sexual status orientation religion class even there is always some kind of violence whether that be physical or kind of metaphorical and so I kind of settled on the topic of women resisting and I'm currently reading a book by Stella Dadzi who was one of the founding members of OAD Um, if you've listened to last week's episode you know I spoke a lot about Stella Dadzi I am a Stella Dadzi hardcore fan I just love everything she does um, everything she writes everything she says I know about it Um, and so I got this book when it came out last year, but I was doing my dissertation and didn't get a chance to fully read it, although I did start it. And so I have nearly finished it. I haven't finished it all, but the chapters and sections I wanted to speak about today, I have read and I'm going to speak about them. And I'm going to be talking about black women, not just during slavery, but in its majority during slavery um, and pre-slavery, resisting, resisting violence, resisting colonial rule, resisting suffering, resisting pain, and resisting in different ways, you know. I think right now as women we're resisting by making sure our voices are heard, whether that's on social media 
or physically outside of Parliament or, you know, at that bandstand in Clapham last night. We are resisting in different ways and so are these women and for different reasons and for different causes. Um, but I think it's important to highlight them today um, and maybe their legacy um, and the things that they fought for can inspire and spur us on to keep striving and keep resisting because society right now for women is looking extremely ugly. Don't get me wrong, it seems to be as ugly as it has been in my lifetime. Um, but when I look back to how far women have come, is there hope? I guess so. Um, and you'll know I haven't even spoken about black women in this whole conversation because whilst we think about Sarah Everard, um, you know, there are so many cases where things like this happen to black women and, you know, our names don't even make it into the paper until there's a large enough public outcry on social media or something similar. And before I go on to the charity that I want to highlight this week, I also want to think about uh, Blessing Ola Sagan, who was 21 um, and found dead on Bexhill Beach, um, I think, last year, if I believe correctly. Um, and, yeah, last year, September. And, you know... Nobody has ever found out what happened to her. The results from the post-mortem, it, it doesn't add up, you know. Her death was is unexplained, but not suspicious. And, you know, her name didn't necessarily make it on different covers. And I want to think us to think about that, you know. As we think about these black women today, this is still a Black History podcast and I still will be highlighting um, the resistance of black women. Um, but I also want to think about the erasure and the fact that you know, the women I'm going to speak about today, the information and the sources available on them were not exactly easy to come by until more recent times. Not because they didn't exist, but because people weren't really caring to look for them. Um, but I am grateful for the work of, of those historians and those archivists that are pulling out these histories um, and so that we can, you know, honour and celebrate these women that came before us. I think it goes without saying that the charity this week that I'm going to highlight as part of my little Women's History Month um, charity drive, the first week we had Sister Space, last week we had Women for Refugees, and this week it will, of course, be Reclaim the Streets. And I think that it's very important at this time that, you know, if you can give, you do. That can be your protest, you know. It doesn't have to be your voice. Um, but I think in the context of what's happening in regards to women being arrested for their attendance at that vigil and probably for their attendance at protest today um, at Parliament and also the fact that I think there might be fines that have to be paid and I think that, that that's what the money was intended for. However, the vigils were like officially cancelled even though people still obviously turned up because that was the original plan and I think the money that has been fundraising, fundraised now will be for um, women's charities and I think they w will probably be in the best place to divide this money up into different women's groups that need it. But of course, you know, there's charities that I've, I've mentioned in the past few weeks that are also deserving and needing of funding, especially in a pandemic where fundraising at, is at an all-time low. Um, and so, yeah, Reclaim the Streets is my charity for this week and I will be probably doing a post about them some point next week. It'll be interesting to see where this story develops as we go into a week where there will be a vote on police powers and regarding protests next week. And obviously we hope that doesn't go through, but you never know. And so saying that, stay tuned, I guess, for more foolishness. In this country we call Great Britain or we don't because is it really great um but enough of that and enough of yeah enough of what's happening in our world right now let's transport ourselves back back into a different time um where we are going to think about black women resisting and I'm going to talk a little bit about theory a bit of feminist theory or mm, feminist, I use that word very sparingly with like 10 pinches of salt because does it apply to black women always? Mm, not really. Um, but we're going to look at the term misogynoir and we're going to look at um, slave societies. We're going to go to Africa. We're going to go to the Caribbean. It's going to be a great episode. We're not literally going to go there. I wish we could. Oh, dreaming of a holiday. 
Um, but let me get into this episode um, before I bore you with all these intros and context. So a common and really annoying narrative and point people always raise when you talk about slavery is this idea of like, oh, but African people sold each other out. It wasn't just white people kidnapping um, Africans and taking them to the Caribbean or to the Americas. It was African people. They sold each other out. Um, You know, they were literally trading uh, people. And whilst that's obviously true, in very few cases that was, you know, that happened. And that's okay. You can bring that up. But when you bring that up in response to the argument and the fact that slavery, for the most part, was funded and supported by European colonisers who went to Africa to kidnap people and steal them and treat them as cargo and property and force them to work the lands of many different countries that they had no business being in. It's very, very problematic. And, you know, people know what they're doing when they bring up that argument. But what I don't like as well is the fact that Why is it that there is such a fixation with, you know, the African people, the African leaders that, you know, traded people or gave people to the colonisers? Why don't we speak about the people that resisted? Why don't we speak about the women, you know, that literally were walking into the sea, committing suicide and killing others around them so that they would not have to cross over into um, a system of slavery and be enslaved? Why don't we talk about um, the women that did all that they could to make sure that ships were overthrown, slave ships where men were shackled to the decks below, shackled to each other in confined and cramped spaces. Women were not because women were not believed to be a threat, but it was the women that followed the crew members around that made sure they knew where the weapons were. So in the time of an insurrection, they were able to lead it. Why don't we speak about those women? Why don't we speak about that? Why was I never taught that at school? I think I say this every week. I mean, this podcast is essentially trying to teach people things that they weren't taught at school that they should have been. But this is one of those things that seriously infuriates me because, like, I went to an all-girls school and, you know, sitting there as one of the only black girls in the classroom when we learned about slavery with everybody staring at you. If I had known this stuff, I think I would have been so empowered... And I don't think it would have empowered just me. Hmm. Anyway, let me get into these people. Let me tell you about these women, these courageous and great women. We are looking at Stella Dadsies, A Kick in the Belly, Women, Slavery and Resistance. I'm using this uh, primarily as my knowledge base this week. Also, just things that I've learned along the way. I did a course, um, I think last, last year, actually. It was the start of last lockdown in 2020. um, And it was about black women that you should know about. Um, in history and it was pre like pre Windrush pre everything pre everything it was like during slavery um, and a lot of the women that I'm reading about in Stella Dadsy's book um, I heard about in that course and so I'm really happy to kind of bring them all together now I don't have like long you know lists of information about their lives and what they did after these individual events because the way the history was recorded at those times anyway um, it didn't really care to mention women and so as much as I would love to do an episode on each of these women individually and I'm sure I could if I really put my mind to it um, I think thinking about women more as a collective in in the form of resistance and what they did um, seems to be a better fit for this podcast I think so Please forgive me if you feel like I'm rushing through um, each woman, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of, of, you know, what African women are made of, the stocks that we come from. So in 1701, the Royal African Company, Royal African Company essentially being like a British trading company set up by the British crown, the monarchy, the monarchy that's not racist, that monarchy that literally set up a trading company to colonise Africa, um, West Africa in particular. Um, Yeah, just bringing in another topic of the week. Um, The royal family, though, is not racist. So, you know, we've, we've heard it from William. We've heard it from all their supporters. It's not racist. But it colonised and enslaved millions of Africans. Just, just, yeah just let let that marinate yep let that sit in your brain okay so royal african company 
wrote a letter to those factors at the Cape Coast Castle to alert them to the dangers of local resistance led by a woman who clearly had so much power um, because, you know, big, big Royal African Company are writing a letter to make sure that they are warned about this woman. And the letter said, we are informed of a Negro woman that has some influence in the country and employs it always against our influence, Juan Tegeba. This you must inspect and prevent in the best methods you can and least expense. So basically they were saying get rid of her. You know, find out what she's doing, find out how she's doing it and get rid of her. She was one of the many African women who resisted um, the Europeans in the early 17th century. Um, Another woman, Queen Anna Nzinga, um, the Queen of Ndongo, from around 1581, and I believe she died in about 1663. Another opponent, um, a woman who... uh, was kind of not fighting against British imperialism and colonisation, but it was in Portuguese. Um, And throughout her reign, she would dress up as a man um, instead of um, women's clothing to obviously appear more dominant. She was called king as opposed to queen, and she insisted in that. Um, Her character, when she first encountered colonial leaders and governors from Portugal, um, she was really playing the game to ensure the safety of as many Africans as possible. You know, she faked conversion to Christianity, um, allowed herself to be baptised and renamed Donna Ana de Souza. She learnt Portuguese. However, she always distrusted them um, and she always knew that she had to play the game to kind of change the game in a way um, and to win. Um, she refused to be their puppet. She was never subdued by them. And her resistance, you know, it was constantly attacked and it was constantly repressed, but she persisted. So King Nzinga of Ndongo and Matamba was king or queen. Um, but obviously I'm referring to her as king as that is the, the title she chose. Um, she was born in around 1583 died in around 1663 um, and she was living and in the royal family of the area that is now Angola um, and she's known as the mother of Angola actually. Um, so she's born into the royal family of Ndongo in Central West um, around 1583 as we've said and her father was king and the monarch and her brother came to power after he died Um, However, he felt paranoid that maybe Nzinga's um, son one day would plot to have him assassinated. So he ordered her son to be killed. She had a son and also had Nzinga sterilised so she couldn't have a child again. Um, Nzinga fled to the kingdom of Matamba where she stayed until her brother asked for her return and to be ambassador to Portugal. Now, Portugal at this time are trying to Uh, colonise this part of Angola. Um, Her brother's failing to deal with the Portuguese and he needed Nzinga's help to negotiate a treaty, so she comes back as, like, an ambassador. Um, As a diplomat, she spoke fluent Portuguese at the time. You know, there was famine, there was terror, a lot of people were suffering in her country and she was trying to do best by them. When she came to meet the Portuguese, they would normally meet the Ndongo people. They would meet in Western clothing. She said she was wearing her opulent, traditional... Um, Ndongo clothing um, of the people in order to really highlight the fact that her clothing was not inferior. She would not bow down to the conventions of of Western European colonisers. And also, which is a key part of this story that I always love to hear, um, in a weird way, it's like a really weird anecdote, but so important, I think. Um, So when she arrived to meet the Portuguese, you know, in her traditional um, clothing... There were only chairs for the Portuguese people and there was a mat on the floor for her as if she was some kind of animal. Um, And this kind of behaviour was common, of course. Um, You know, Europeans did not think of Africans as much, even though she was of royal blood and a leader of a country. Um, Well, not a whole country at that time, a region, um, which was in itself a kingdom um, based on like geographical lines at the time. Um, and so, yeah, she's seen this mat on the floor and she's kind of thinking, you're not going to put me on the floor in a corner just because I'm African, because she knows exactly what this is. Um, 
So she asked her soldier to form himself into a chair and she sat on his body, formed into a chair for the whole of the meeting. So she was higher than the governor and she could speak to him face to face. She didn't play with the Portuguese is what I'm saying to you. She knew their tricks and she won up them every time. She reached an agreement with the Portuguese um, and it led to the withdrawal of the Portuguese troops from Ndongo and recognition of its sovereignty as a state and as a kingdom um, and an independent one at that, not a conquered state, not a vassal. Um, and in return, she said that there would be trade between the Portuguese and she would also study Christianity and become baptised. She was able to save her people from being colonised and also her military tactics and skill led to them you know, beating the Portuguese army at several points um, in battle um, throughout her, her reign over that kingdom. And she's known and remembered as the mother of um, Angola and she has a beautiful statue um, in the country. And I think whilst we might be thinking, well, you know, she quote-unquote um, converted and she, she played the game and whilst... You know, she didn't necessarily completely banish all the Portuguese um, from her kingdom. She wasn't able to do that. I think she played the game as best she could and resisted in a way that was best for her people and for her kingdom for as long as she possibly could. Um, and hence why she is one of one of the women we're thinking about today. There was also Amina, the warrior house of queen of Zazwa, modern day Zaria. She led an army of over 20,000 in her wars of expansion, surrounded her city with defensive walls that were unknown to this day as Amina's walls. Um, and in House of Praise songs, she's actually known as a woman as capable as a man. She reigned for over 35 years, and that's taken from a kick in the belly. Um, another woman listed, Beatrice Kimpavita, born 1684, died in 1706 of Congo. She insisted Jesus was an African, and her call to Congolese unity was taken as a direct challenge to the designs of European slavers and missionaries. She was burnt at the stake, actually, as a heretic, um, with her baby son. Her spiritual influence spread so far and so wide that enslaved Haitians used to use her words um, from her prayers as a rallying cry when they rose up in rebellion almost a century later um, in the Haitian Revolution, which was like 1797, again taken from a kick in the belly. There's Ya Santewa who came to embody this spirit of female resistance. Um, she was leader of the Ashanti in their struggle against British colonialism. She denounced her fellow chiefs for allowing their king, Asante Thine, uh, to be seized and exiled. I'm sorry if I'm butchering any of the pronunciations of these words. I am terribly sorry. Um, I am trying my best um, and have listened to videos where people speak about these uh, wonderful women um, to make sure I don't do that, but I don't think I'm doing a great job. But we'll see. You can let me know on social media if I've butchered them. But anyway, um, Ya Santewa, born in 1840, um, would have been around 60 when elected in as a leader of an army of 5,000 in the Ashanti War of Resistance against the British um, at the turn of the 20th century. And Stella Dadzi notes that the British described her as the soul and head of the whole rebellion. Um, she is the mother or aunt of a chief who was sent into exile with the king. Um, and she, whilst she was defeated and exiled herself, she is a Ghanaian national hero and a figure of inspiration um, to this day because of her defiance and her resistance against colonial rule. And now I'm going to talk about some of the rebellions that happened on slave ships. Because in this book, you know, a lot of the things I'd heard before, I might not have known the exact details, but the idea of women leading rebellions on slave ships was something I had no idea about. Even studying slavery, um, such a lot at university, I just never knew. Um, so, essentially, whilst the men tended to be clapped in the leg irons and handcuffed in pairs or in, like, lines... Um, you know, the, you can kind of picture that image of a, the bottom of a slave ship with men lying as close together as possible, um, shackled and chained, um, because obviously they were perceived as a threat and nobody would want them to, you know, try and do anything or overthrow the ship. Um, but women and children were perceived as less of a threat, so they were unshackled. Um, they had a lot of mobility around um, a ship. They could discover the crew's movements and also where their weapons were kept. 
And so this is why they tended to lead or help instigate revolts on the ship. And I have four named like rebellions um, on different ships. So there was one on um, a ship called the Robert of Bristol. There was one on the Eagle, one on the Little George, one on the Thomas in 1797 on route to Barbados. Um, and let me tell you about the one, the first one I mentioned on the Robert of Bristol. And so I'll read out um, a extract from Stella Dadsey's book where she says, being more at large was to watch for the proper opportunity. She brought Tomba, the ringleader, word one night that there were no more than five white men upon the deck and they were um, asleep, bringing him a hammer at the same time, all the weapons that she could find to execute the treachery. He encouraged the accomplices what he could, but could now engage only one more, and the woman to follow him up on deck. Um, unfortunately for them, they only managed to dispatch two members of the crew, um, and they were over overwhelmed. Um, and the punishment, and I didn't really want to go too much into these kinds of things because I just think they're so traumatic. However, um, this is what happened, and I think the realities of slavery are often really covered up and tied into somewhat of a, a neater bow than what they actually were. Um, and so the three of the kind of leaders of the rebellion were actually forced to eat the heart and liver of one of their comrades before they were executed. Um, so yes, they were forced to eat the heart and liver of their comrades um tomba is a man um i don't think i made that clear and was the ringleader in this rebellion in this revolt but the women are not named they are nameless but their fate was no less cruel on account of their gender said stella Dadzi. um so the captain hoisted her up by her thumbs and whipped and slashed her with knives um, before the other slaves in front of them to make sure, obviously, they didn't get any ideas and put them off until she died. And there's an image of that, and I'll probably use it, actually, for the uh, Instagram post and on Twitter because I think it definitely highlights um, the way that women were treated no differently um, in the conditions of slavery to men, for the most part. Obviously, we've already said they were left unshackled um, in the ships and on the journey. So... Yeah, that's what happened to that rebellion that obviously didn't succeed. And it's hard to overthrow, come on, a whole ship when the majority of the people that would fight for you are, are shackled and not in great health or comfort or any kind of mental peace. So there was another another attempt, um, different ship, different route on the crew. The crew of the Little George, um, you know, there were around... 400 men, actually, and women and children that were able to escape. Um, this was done in 1704. Um, and again in 1730, where 96 Africans, 61 of them were women, um, subdued the crew off the Guinea coast and took control of the ship. Um, and so, yeah, another case of, of women being part of... Um, a rebellion and unnamed again another mutiny took place on the thomas in 1797 which was um, about to dock in barbados women again cited as the instigators they were allowed to um, be unshackled i think to take exercise take refreshment um, and when they did so they armed themselves with the contents of an unlocked musket chest and they freed the shackled men and helped them take control of the ship. Unfortunately, they didn't know how to navigate the ship and they drifted for six weeks until a British warship attacked and subdued them. They were taken to Haiti, the survivors, um, where they were sold. So whilst essentially in the, the grand scheme of things, they were not successful um, and ended up being enslaved anyway, they resisted. And I like to think about enslaved people as having agency um, not in the way that Kanye West said, you know, oh, if I was a slave, I would have, like, got out of it or it was something that they could have changed. But these little acts and big acts in this case, you know, the consequences of, of being caught trying to overthrow a ship, having to eat the liver and heart of your fellow enslaved people and then executed yourself. These acts of resistance are often forgotten and the fact that, you know, on ship mutinies were often led by women something I never knew about, um, again, erased. Um, I think it was important to talk about these little acts of resistance. I should stop saying little. They definitely were not little. Um, and finally, I'm going to introduce Nanny of the Maroons, um, but I think next episode will be an episode about her only. 
I, I don't think I know. Um, the next episode will be about Nanny of the Maroon. So if you are listening and that episode is already out, then, you know, jump on, jump into that one next. Um, but I will introduce uh, Nanny of the Maroons as part of the Maroon Settlers, um, who are said to be descendants of the Akan people of Ghana. She is the only woman noted and listed as a national hero of Jamaica, and she her face is on the $500 bill in Jamaica. And she just embodies resistance in the most obvious form in terms of her military tactics and her prowess and her ability to fight off the British and save so many enslaved people um, who were able to escape to the hills of the Maroon people um, in the kind of central areas of Jamaica, which are really hilly and mountainous, um, as opposed to obviously the coastal areas where all the ships would have docked in, um, which are less hilly because they're coastal. Um, but Jamaica is really hilly anyway. Um, so it was, I think, easier for the Maroons, knowing the lay of the land, to fight back um, and beat the British um, in so many different occasions and ways. And I won't speak too much about her today because we are going to have the next episode on her and it will be spectacular because she is one of my historical inspirations, one of my favourite people to think about historically. And I know I say that pretty much every week about somebody or someone that we talk about, um, but yeah, this one's definitely going to be a good episode. So Nanny of the Maroons next week, the Maroon people, who they were, what they did um, and how she resisted, Um, you know, We're living in difficult times, I'll say. I will say traumatic times. I think between the story of Meghan Markle, um, Sarah Everard's death, the police and the violence towards those at the vigil and those protesting now um, at Parliament and the idea that protest laws could change and be taken away in a democracy, our right to protest to be taken away is extremely scary in a pandemic where we are already so limited to what we can do for our own safety and the safety of those around us. Um, It's a heavy time. Look after yourselves. Please tap into different sources of enjoyment and entertainment because, you know, the news is not a nice place always. History can be traumatic and so can our present, but our future, we must look at it with hope and so... If you're struggling right now, please do think to the future. But I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I hope you enjoy the episodes to come. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any spare money, please donate to Reclaim the Streets. And if you don't know anything I'm talking about in regards to this whole movement, maybe you don't live in England or you haven't tapped into the news recently, please do educate yourselves, you know, do the work, do the reading um, to make sure you know what's happening and make sure you are... Being a voice, if that's how you resist, or being a presence, or being an educated body in society today. Thank you. Bye.